CPA from you as I qualified in 97. So in fact, I brought CPA to India through, you know, I got the franchise rights for Becker. So I, I run Orbit Institutes and, you know, we have centers in 12 cities. We do training for all the big companies. And uh, also I have two CPA firms, you know, one is called US India Tax. Uh, it has a back office in Pune, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm teaching you this class from New Jersey. I have another CPA firm in New Jersey called Sherma Marcus. So today we are starting. Uh, so that's my introduction very briefly. And uh, maybe uh, you can start one by one. And Manish, uh, maybe we can start with you. Uh, if you could mention your name and then uh, what your background is, and then we go to the next person. Yeah, my name is Manish Prajapati from New Delhi. I'm a working professional, working as a uh, deputy manager in account stable department. Done MBA from ICFAI. Okay. Who else is there? Uh, hi, my name is Sanatan. I work uh, for uh, DPR Construction US and we have a branch in uh, Pune. It's called WeConstruct. I lead the accounts in uh, WeConstruct here. Okay, Sanatan. Hi, myself Karthik. I'm an Associated Chartered Certified Accountant, as well as I hold a Master's in Financial Management. Currently, I work as a head of the business systems in San Mauritius, offshore company in Mauritius. Okay. Hi, I'm Nima. I just completed my Bachelor's of Arts in Accounting and Business Finance from Harriet Watt University in the UK. And where are you located, Nima? Uh, I'm in Abu Dhabi right now. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so we'll uh, <clears throat> now, uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, I uh, like I'm a CPA uh, licensed in three states um, in uh, Ohio, in uh, New Jersey, and in Florida. And um, we have two CPA firms. So, you know, in the whole process of uh, doing your CPA, uh, the first step is to I'm just going to quickly go with it, then we'll start the class. The first step is to make sure that you're eligible for CPA. And what is required to write the CPA examination is 120 semester hours in accounting. And uh, so, you know, so you have to make copies of your certificates and send them for eligibility. So that is the first step that you need to do. After that is done, after you get an approval to write the CPA certificate, then, you know, of course, you, you start the course. And uh, generally people uh, complete, prepare at home again and write the examination between seven to 12 months. And just about two months before you're ready for the exam, you uh, schedule your examination with Prometric and then uh, they'll give you the dates when you wanna write. The examination can be written you know, throughout the year. And uh, luckily, you, know, you can write the examinations from India now. And then once you do that, I mean, uh, your score is 75% in each paper. And once you clear, you have passed the CP examination. Uh, to get your complete certification, uh, you need to have 150 semester hours. Now, okay, sometimes I have a, I have one question here. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, to get the transcript from the universities where I've done my bachelor and masters, so it'll take uh, somewhere around two to three months, right? To uh, to send those to Nesba and then you know get the well evaluation done of the document, right? Right. And they will let me know where you know for from which state I am eligible. So is is it not enough uh, from your faculty uh, to get the confirmation that whether I am eligible or not? If we send a document to any of your faculty, because I I sent out my uh, document to Sri Ram and he confirmed that you know I am eligible from Alaska. So is it not enough as of now? No, 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 that is enough. Basically, I'll tell you one thing. When uh, the first step is that you send your certificates to us and we give you we give you indicators that yes, based on your education background, you will qualify. Okay, so it's, it's kind of a 99.999% confirmed that you are eligible. Uh, so you don't need to worry, but you know, you cannot write uh, the examination without getting a formal uh, approval by the NASBA. 
so when you when you write to us and we tell you you are eligible it means you you are you just have to submit your documents but you can start the course okay okay kamlesh what i would suggest is that you know you uh, if we have told you that you are eligible so there will not be any issues so after 3 months when you get all your documents from uh, the university you notarize them and send it to nasba and then they will give you a confirmation within 4 to 5 weeks and in the meantime you are preparing the course anyways okay, okay and uh, you know as a part of uh, this whole training we uh, you know i've been living in uh, canada us uh, Uh, almost for the last twenty years, and I came back to India. I was in India for ten, twelve years. I still come to India all the time, so uh, we will help you with uh, everything. Basically, you know, we we do training for Deloitte, for KPMG, for ENY, American Express. We have one hundred and twenty CPA teachers in India, so throughout the process, we will guide you with everything. You know, from eligibility to writing the examination, scheduling the examination, getting license, uh, uh, license to practice. Now. uh so as i mentioned to you to be certified you need 150 semester hours suppose if you to write the examination you can write it with 120 semester hours but to get your certificate you need 150 so you write the examination suppose if you are short of four or five credits so you can take an extra course at a university in india and just complete those credits and then get your certificate now the cpa qualification is a two tier qualification we have a cpa certificate we have a cpa license now you uh, a license means you are allowed to practice and do audits uh so for that one you need 2 years of experience after you are after you have passed your examination not every cpa gets licensed uh, i am licensed in uh, in uh, ohio in uh, new jersey in florida uh because you know i i do a few audits here but um, the difference between a certificate and a, and a, and a license is that uh, only a licensed cpa can do audits now if you look at my cross section of the work that i do i do a lot of you know accounting bookkeeping payroll financial advisory tax preparation all this i can do uh, even without a license the only the only time i need a license is if i want to audit a particular client in the us you know unlike india we have three kinds of attestation reports we got uh, a review report a compilation report and an audit report and it is mandatory only for public companies in the united states to get to get their accounts audited private companies and non public companies and uh, uh, do not need to get an audit done they can get a review or a compilation yeah throughout you know in the entire scope of things that i do only about 2% of my clients uh, require an audit so a, a certificate holder can do mostly 90 98% of what i do so it's it but if you want to practice and you want to get into audits you need a license and license means uh, license is granted by the state uh, you need to fulfill 2 years of experience after you pass your examination okay we're going to start today with the financial accounting and reporting now every country every country has its own accounting standards and policies now when whenever we talk of accounting standards and policies what what exactly are we talking of we these are uh, guidelines not only guidelines these are formal guidelines formal guidelines means they have been uh, they have, there's a statute behind each one so these are guidelines which these are policies and regulations which tell us how to record financial information and how to disclose financial information now you know whenever we're talking of uh, financial statements you know we're talking of the balance sheet we're talking of the income statement we're talking of the statement of cash flows the statement of shareholders equity so the entire financial statements in their bodies have a lot of financial information so uh, these policies require and it, in us generally accepted accounting principles require that these these be presented in the uh, according to the policy a policy now who is in charge of the policy in us is the securities exchange commission now the securities exchange commission uh, is basically de deals with the uh, you know trading of securities issuing of new securities and they are the ones who are liable uh, for regulating and issuing these policies it was established in uh, 1934 and regulation sx 
uh, is the one that uh, you know determines by by the form of a statute what policies and protects should we have. Now you know behind every policy there are interpretation bulletins, there are accounting releases, and all that stuff. So there are various steps. You know, it, it sometimes it has to go through a public uh, hearing also. So over the period of time, right from 1939 to 1959, uh, a committee on accounting procedures was the body that was uh, responsible for issuing this uh, accounting policies and principles. And then we got accounting principles board opinion 1959 to 1973. We're just giving you giving you the history of how uh, gap evolved. So from 1973, there's only one body one body which is responsible uh, for issuing regulations and policies telling us how to you know uh, disclose and uh, uh, inf disclose and report financial information and that is called the financial accounting standards board so right now any release any release of the vice chancellor accounting uh, standards board is a formal uh, gap policy or principle any any releases by accounting principles board opinion or cap are not are not principles anymore so from from 1973 only one body which is called the financial accounting standards board is permitted and authorized to that and just like i mentioned you know when whenever you issue you got technical bulletins you got interpretations and so there's a whole series of steps before you come to the policy now all policies become formal once they are codified. What do we, what do we mean by codified? Codified means you give a particular specific number. In the regulation, you know, regulation SX uh, is is a very comprehensive regulation which classifies uh, gap according to various you know uh, codes and sub codes and subsections and all the stuff. So I'll give you an example. Like if it, say all revenue items will go under code 5000. <clears throat> now, even, even within revenue items, we got revenues from various sources. You know, we could have rental revenue, we could have interest income, uh, we could have capital gains, we could have wages, we could have, you know, different kinds of revenues. So each kind of revenue uh, would be sales, we could have sales, each kind of revenue would be, would have a separate code. So you'll start off with 5,000, which means it's a revenue code. You'll go to subsection, say 121, which could be rental income. And then even after subsex, uh, subsection, you can have sub subsection from 121, it could go to uh, two. Two could mean uh, rental income from uh, farming. You could, re you could rent your land for farming or could mean rental income from a commercial body, a commercial building or things like that. So that is all about codification. So in very simple terms, any policies issued by FASP and codified are authoritative US GAAP accounting principles. Nothing else is authoritative. <coughs> so now 1.3, if you look at private company consoles, <clears throat> Now, as I mentioned to you, Securities Exchange Commission regulates what? Public companies. Companies that are listed on the uh, New York Stock Exchange or Stock Exchange. So, so all the accounting principles and policies are formulated by Securities Exchange Commission and are specific to public companies. <clears throat> now, do private companies not follow GAAP? The private companies also follow GAAP. <clears throat> but you could have a less comprehensive codified uh, manual for private companies. Okay, so the private com uh, company council PCC is established as an alternative to US GAAP to make private company financial reporting less complex and more cost, cost beneficial. So for FASPs for public companies, even private companies follow FASP. But if you, if you don't want to, because it is a very elaborate regulation, SX is a very elaborate bifurcation into all these categories. If you don't want to follow all that, then, and you're a very small company, you can follow PCC also. That is also acceptable. All accounting policies and principles are an ongoing procedure. I mean, you know, we keep on making changes to how to report financial information, how to disclose financial information. I'll give you one example of this change. Now, five years ago, a change in accounting principle 
like whenever we uh, so when we when we say a change in accounting principle i'll give you an example here say we we talk of revenue recognition now there are even when you when you talk of revenue recognition uh, revenue recognition has different uh, uh, you know rules uh, i could recognize less less like completed uh, long term contracts so long term contracts can uh, have revenue recognition under two methods one is the completed contract method and the other one is the percentage of completion contract method okay so completed contract method means basically when it is very very difficult to forecast the cost of a particular project you will not recognize revenue till the whole project is completed because cost determination is very very difficult completed contract method means percentage of completion contract method means that you know i can estimate cost i can estimate my profit so then instead of deferring my revenue recognition till the completion of the project i will recognize revenue recognition as and when the project is completed based on costs incurred to total costs so suppose if there's a change in accounting principle you know a company has been recognizing revenue based on completed contract method and then they switch to uh, switch to a percentage of completion contract method so this is a change in accounting principle now previously uh, about 5 years ago any impact uh because of this change in revenue recognition from one principal to another was a part of income statement now uh 5 years ago it was changed and they said that it's not a part of income statement so those those are kind of things now also uh us cap and uh, is now very closely interconnected with international financial reporting standards you know this is basically the body in europe which regulates uh, all the accounting policies and principles and uh, so even there is there's everybody you know all all countries are trying to have one uniform accounting standards so there is going to be a bit of overlap between uh, international financial reporting standards they might have different revenue recognition uh, or different principles slightly different than us cap so even in your cpa examination you are tested on uh, international financial reporting standards and how they differ from us cap so this this particular section section 1 was dealing with the evolution of us cap now the conceptual framework of financial reporting you know whenever you whenever you report information in your in your financial statements you have to you have to see why are you reporting it what kind of information do you report what are the basic uh, basic concepts uh, basically the foundation the foundation of all this reporting uh, principles and those are called concepts so financial accounting concepts that serve as a basis of a basis of pronouncements uh, are are the one so the first one if you look at F, sfac number 8 what is the objective of reporting financial information why do we need to report financial information a lot of people depend upon this financial information to extend a loan to the company to invest in the company like shareholders you know will look at the financial statements of a company and choose whether to you know buy shares or not buy shares uh, lenders would look at the uh, you know the credibility of the company or the net worth of the company uh, whether to extend loans creditors uh, would look at whether you know if if i'm going to supply you my material you are buying material from me uh, will i get paid and regulate uh, regulation bodies will also are also the users of financial information so the primary users are basically investors lenders creditors and other regulatory uh, information now what is what is financial information financial information are basically uh, what are the resources of the company what are, what belongs to the company you know the company has its own cash the company has so much receivables the company has uh, and against the resources we have claims what are the liabilities of the company and uh, so basically you will really want to know what is the net worth of the company like you know uh, assets minus liabilities and how much and then you also prepare a cash flow statement to figure out whether you know all these assets are in the form of cash or not cash and all the stuff so this this section dealt with the 211 dealt with the users now secondly whenever you report financial information all this financial information is required to have certain characteristics and now whenever under you under the you know accounting concepts 
these financial information are broken up into two primary categories. We have primary categories and we have subcategories. So what are the primary categories of financial information? The primary categories of financial information are that the information should be relevant. And second primary uh, characteristics of the information is that it should have faithful representation. One is it should be relevant and secondly should be reliable. So faithful representation means reliable. Now, so these are, so whenever you get a question, what are the primary characteristics of financial information? You're talking of relevance and faithful representation. Now the subcategories, what do we mean by relevance? Relevance means uh, the information that you present in your financial statements should have predictive value. You should be able to predict the future outcome of the, com uh, of the company. Like say, if, if, I've, uh, if I'm showing liabilities, it will tell you that, okay, you know, the, the, we'll have to pay this. What is confirmatory? And then uh, relevant should also have confirmatory values. Confirmatory values means that, you know, if I have accounts receivable on my balance sheet, I should be able to confirm it. And then second thing is, uh, the third one is, so under relevance, we have predictive, confirmative, and materiality. Now, what do we, what do we mean by materiality? You don't want to present every kind of information separately some you know you uh, big, you sometimes you club a lot of information because one information might not be very relevant to be presented separately so when we talk of materiality materiality has two dimensions you know one is it, it should be uh, it should be relevant for financial statement interpretation and it is so it is quantitative so there's a certain number which says that okay anything below this amount or above this amount is material like I'll, I'll tell you once a lot of lot of small companies have a have a policy saying that any purchases under under five thousand dollars will not be capitalized at all they will all be expensed okay even though those expenditures that you make have uh, have more than uh, a useful life of more than one year like i'll give it a say i buy some uh, manufacturing tools uh, and I buy tools of uh, $5,000 and those tools will be used for five years. Now, technically, you know, basically we should, you know, um, uh, amortize or depreciate those tools over five years. But because of materiality, the company has taken a policy that anything under 5,000 will be immediately expensed. So, so you will expense that materiality. Secondly, materiality is, so that is a quantitative aspect of materiality. The second thing is that even, even uh, uh, materiality can have a subjective dimension. A subjective dimension means at the interpretation of the management or at the interpretation of the auditor, I consider certain information to be very material. Now, so whenever, whenever something is considered very material, it needs to be disclosed separately disclosed and reported separately now one example irrespective of the dollar amount now what is one example of a, a materiality based on subjective dimension is related party transactions say uh, if a company extends a loan or a or a housing benefit to a director it is it is a it is a related party transaction so it has to be reported and has to be disclosed okay so it, it, irrespective of what the dollar amount is. Now, the second primary characteristic is it should be relevant, which basically reliable. And uh, they, they use the word under US, under concepts, they use the word faithful representation. Faithful representation means that the material should be, the subcategories are it should be complete. You should report everything. And it should be neutral. What does, what does neutral mean? It should be neutral from errors. There should be no mistakes at all. And also, it, also neutral means it should not be biased. The management cannot uh, pressurize you, uh, pressurize you into presenting the information what they think should be presented. So it should all information should be presented according to uh, U.S. generally accepted economic principles and not be biased by the management. And the third one is should be free from material, free from errors. Basically, you know, it should be, uh, there should be no uh, mistakes at all. So then, you know, the various steps of identifying 
uh, steps to apply the fundamental qualitative procedures, uh, identify the event and see whether, whether it's a transaction, what, what it uh, goes to. So, so the key thing to remember here is now whenever we talk of financial information, we've got primary characteristics which are you know, relevant and reliable and relevance and faithful representation. Then we got subcategories. Now, in addition to this, we got what is called enhancing qualitative characteristics. So just remember that we got primary characteristics and in two primary characteristics. Under each primary characteristic, we got sub characteristics. Now then to enhance the importance of these categories, we have what is called enhancing qualitative characteristics. And the first one is comparability. I should be able to compare. Now, you know, we have, we have different companies uh, and you can, different companies cannot present information in any way that they like. They should present information according to US generally accepted accounting principles. That is why comparability is important. I can compare the financial statements of one software company with a, with another company. So, so that is, that is comparability. Secondly, I mean, this is, you know, between industries, between one company versus another company, even within, even within a company, you know, in the U S cap, we are required to make uh, for public companies are required to present comparative statements. Uh, I have audited the balance sheet of company a for years X one X two. So you are presenting two years of financial statements. So there should be, you should be able to compare the results of two years, one year to the second year. So that is also comparability. Now, if I have inventory valuations in one year uh, under, under one method and in, in the other year under a different method, those accounts are not comparable. Is it allowed? Is it allowed to have different accounting principles between periods? Yes, it is allowed as long as it is disclosed. So you have to disclose it that, you know, in year X1, we use the LIFO method of inventory valuation and we change it to the FIFO method in year two. So, so comparability between information from one year to another year is one aspect. Comparability between industries. Then it should be verifiable. You know, when we say verifiable, you know, verifiable means confirmations. You know, you, you get a letter of confirmation from the bank that yes, um, uh, the company has taken a loan from you. You get a confirmation from the creditors, accounts receivable that yes, uh, we owe you so much money. And then it should be timeliness. It should be available to the reader as soon as possible. And it should be understandable. Now, even the format and the way the financial information is presented should be, should be in a manner which is easily understandable by a reader who's got basic knowledge who's got basic knowledge of all this financial information. So what are the, what are the, what is the drawback of financial information? Drawback means, uh, you know, uh, sometimes we cannot present financial information, which is kind of a drawback. Uh, and the only justification is because the cost does not justify that. Now what happens, I'll, I'll give you one example. Suppose, you know, I'm a company which is located in, in the US, but I've got subsidiaries all over the world. So I will not do, I will not do confirmations of the inventory sitting at different locations throughout the world. I will, rely, maybe I'll rely on uh, the auditors of the other company, or I will uh, get, get some third party confirmation and all this stuff. So the drawback of financial information is that you always, way what is the benefit of uh, getting this information is the cost more than the benefit okay so that is that is the constraint is the constraint of financial information so when we talk of financial statements what are we talking of okay so the, we'll we'll come to fasp number six so we now so just like we had uh, the objectives of uh, of private com of public companies, you know, who are the users of public companies. Similarly, we have uh, non-business organizations, which are basically government and non-profit organizations. And the users are always for non-business organization, the users is the government or the people who donate the money. And, and the main, the main focus for non-business organizations or, uh, or, you know, charities and all that stuff 
is basically, you know, they're custodians. You know, if, if a lot of uh, charitable organization depends upon donations, so they are like stewards to people who donate the money. You want to make sure that all the resources are properly spent and properly used. And uh, the financial information, the users of financial information for all these uh, charitable organizations are, you know, resource providers, the constituents, you know, like if you got state governments, you got local governments, city governments, governing bodies and managers and all the stuff. So the objective of non-business organizations is slightly different. You know, all, all uh, private, uh, all public companies, you know, who are into, uh, who follow GAP and are a non-government are basically, they have a private, they have a profit objective. But you know, non-business organizations do not have a profit objective. They have a objective of providing services. So you want to make sure that you know the resources are properly managed, which is stewardship. They are properly spent, which is uh, performance, and then they are allocated properly. So that that is the objective of uh, non uh, non-business organizations. So now, how is where where and how is this information presented? This information is presented, you know, when we, when we talk of a set of financial statements, you know, we got, of course, we got the management discussions of results. Then we also got, uh, you know, the balance sheet, which is the statement of financial position, which is called the balance sheet. We got the income statement. We got a statement of comprehensive income. We got a statement of cash flows and a statement of sh changes in shareholders equity. So there are five, five statements. Now, Balance sheet, you know that I will will come to that. So balance sheet, income statement, comprehensive income, cash flows, and shareholders equity account. Now, what is what is comprehensive income? Now, there are the the basic definition. You know, we'll discuss study this in more detail. The basic definition of comprehensive income is that these are transactions with non owners. Okay. So whenever we talk of an income statement, you know, uh, we have uh, we have transactions with owners. What do, what do we mean by owners? Owners means anybody and everybody who's got a vested interest in that company. If I'm a if I'm a lender, I'm a, I'm an owner. All the interest payments that I make to a lender are they go to an income statement. So comprehensive income includes transactions with non-owners. Now, what are what? I'll just give you four, three or four examples of what is uh, non-owner transactions. P stands for pensions. So, so you know, uh, basically, what happens is, whenever we, when we, you know, pensions are long-term liabilities of a company, and uh, they are based on a lot of estimates and all that stuff. There could be some changes in what estimates and what are the actuals and all that stuff. So any adjustments because of these changes, and those could be environmental factors, could be the interest rate, could be the discount rate. Those are a part of a, a comprehensive income. Unrealized gains on available for sales securities, foreign currency translations, effective portion of a cash flow hedge. So these categories, you know, because it's a separate chapter, we'll discuss it separately. But just remember that comprehensive income, uh, this is all called other comprehensive income. Other comprehensive income comes under uh, under Puffy. Okay. Then we got the cash flow statement, and then we got the shareholders' equity account. So these are the all the information that we've been talking of is is presented in any one of these five statements. <clears throat> okay. Secondly, what are the how do you recognize this information? Recognition means like you know what at what amount do you recognize? I, if I spend something. Uh, how do I how do I recognize it? Okay, so the first thing is that you should be able to measure that information, and it should be reliable. It should be relevant also. Now, what are the various methods by which you can measure information? Now, US CAP requires you to value information based on uh, certain concepts. So, anything that is property, plant, and equipment. Property, plant, and equipment is always valued at historical cost. The cost you pay to buy that stuff. Inventory is always valued at no current cost. All marketable securities under US CAP, all marketable securities 
are valued at fair market value. What is net realizable value? So, you know, when we sell something to somebody and we got an accounts receivable, do we record that accounts receivable? We always record accounts receivable net of any provision for bad debts. So it is the net realizable value, you know, the gross amount of the receivable minus the minus uh, the provision for bad debts. Now, uh, marketable securities, as I mentioned, is uh, at at uh, the current value. Inventory is at lower of cost or market. So it is the current cost. If the market rate is lower, you will record inventory not at the cost, but at the lower cost. And uh, all long term liabilities are recorded at the present value. So what, when we, whenever we record at present value, we have to basically uh, discount discount the cash flows. Okay, so now what are the assumptions? What you know, whenever we report financial information, we have certain assumptions that we have separately. So first, the first assumption is that you are reporting it for an entity. So there's a particular company, there's a particular entity. Second is that you are also assuming that this entity will continue it continue in operation. So if a, if a particular company has been declared bankrupt, it is not it, it, it is not a going concern assumption. You will not the presentation of financial information for a bankrupt company is totally different from US cap. They have you have different provisions for that. So all financial information makes one assumption that it this company is going to continue in uh, continue existing and will continue operating then it has to be denominated in one particular currency like the US dollar. And then all financial information is dependent is is presented in periods. You know, we have a income statement for one year, we have balance sheet for one year, a balance sheet, you know, as, as of a particular date. For public companies, you also have to present quarterly statements. So every quarter, and then the measurement Principle means it, it, well, at what value it is presented, historical cost, reliable value, and by that you will uh, you'll be able to measure uh, the resources and the things. Now, what is accrual accounting? All financial information according to US CAP has to follow accrual accounting. Uh, there are certain exceptions which are permitted, but right now let's let's look at accru accrual accounting. Accrual accounting is basically you have to match your revenues with your expenditures. I, I spent so much money and how much does it take me to uh, to uh, allocate that money? So I have the revenue recognition principle. Now, when do I recognize revenue? <clears throat> so the, the, there are five steps under US CAP uh, and it's a separate chapter on revenue recognition, which tells you that identify a particular event, uh, break that event into components. It could be, you know, providing sale of hardware plus service, then does the ownership and the risk pass? Uh, is there any default mechanisms? Will I get paid? So there are various specific, uh, five or six steps of revenue recognition and they should be fully disclosed also. So now, so we, we come up to that. Now, what are the what are the elements in financial information? Now, whenever you talk of financial information, you know, we got, we got various terminologies that you should be aware of. One is assets. Now, uh, what are assets? Assets are expenditures which benefit more than one year they're long-term expenditures so uh, if i buy a machinery i will not record it as an expense i'll record it as an asset because it is going to benefit for more, more than one year so it will be a long-term asset on my balance sheet liabilities are uh, you know your uh, obligations in the future so so that you have assets you have liabilities and then you have equity. What is equity? Equity is when we talk when we talk of shareholders equity, basically it means what is the total value which belongs to the shareholders. You have all the assets minus all the liabilities is equal to shareholders equity. What is investment by owners? It is not revenue. If I buy shares in a company, it is an investment by the owner. So it is not classified as revenue. What is, what is distribution to ex owners? If, I, if uh, I pay dividends to a shareholder, it is not an expenditure, it is a distribution to an owner. Comprehensive income, we discussed that and we'll go over in details also. 
so then we have revenues revenues are basically uh, you know sales for a particular period you could have rental revenue also and then we have expenses expenses are what what you spend to generate that revenue now the key thing to remember is that if you look at if you look at uh, the bifurcation in an income statement we got revenues and expenditures these are matching concepts so how much expenses did i incur to generate this revenue then we have gains and losses so revenues and expenditures are operating gains and losses are non matching and non operating if i sell an old factory building it is not classified as revenue it is classified as a gain because there is no matching concept with it so the two things to realize here is uh, the two elements to realize is that revenues and expenditures are operating and revenues and expenditures are presented at gross amounts what do we mean by gross amounts suppose i spend i sell 10000 dollars of merchandise i will record my sales at 10000 to generate those 10000 i spent my overheads my inventory overheads and manufacturing overheads was 6000 so i will present my uh, my cost of goods sold at 6000 so these are gross amounts 10000 for revenue 6000 for expenses and these are matching these are operating but if i have a, if i have an old factory building i bought that old factory building for 50000 i sell it for 100000 there is no matching concept because that factory building is not used for operating activities it is just sitting there and i'm selling it so i will not classify as revenue from the sale of a building i will classify it as a gain on sale of a building so the key thing is a gain is <clears throat> non matching it is non operating and secondly gains and losses are presented at the net amount what do we mean by net amount <clears throat> we do not present the sale price of the factory building separately and the cost of the factory building separately we net them off i had a factory building i sold it for 100000 the cost was 50000 i will, unlike revenue and expenditures i will not show 150 separately i'll show a net gain of 50000 so that is called the net net concept i will not classify it as re revenue or expenditures i'll classify it as gain and losses so so everybody has got that okay secondly uh, now as i remember you know we all your long term liabilities are presented based on the present value measurement present value means uh, now you know, even not only liabilities even assets you know what is i i will look at the uh, for inventory i always value inventory at lower of cost or market what is the current cost uh, current cost of marketable securities now for liabilities uh, it is always the present value of long term liabilities now whenever i'm trying to calculate the present value of uh, say pension payments which i have to do now uh, give you one example and let's let's quickly do this uh, say i'm an employee i'm 50 years old i'm working in a company the company is obligated to pay me pensions for the years of service that i've rendered so i've already worked in the company for 20 years but when do they pay me they pay me after 65 after i retire after 65 and they might pay me from 65 to 80 years that's these are all estimates so what i have to do is in the year 50 i have to recognize for all the services i've already rendered to the company i have to calculate the value value of the obligation to the company i will book that expenditure in the in the year in which i'm serving in the company so i have been booking expenditures for pension from 20 years to 50 years because i've already serviced and i've been booking them in in the year in which i provided the service and this obligation has been accumulating in year 20 i owed 2000 in year 21 i owed 3000 so it keeps on building up and this obligation will be discharged after i retire so how do i calculate the value at which it is reflected say if i'm going to pay at 65 i will calculate the say in, in the year 65 i'm going to pay you 10000 dollars in the year 50 how do i record that i will take the present value of that 10000 at a discount rate and record that liability 
So, so to to get the present value, you need to know the cash flows, how much I'm going to pay out, and you got to know what at when you're going to pay out. You're going to know what is the discount rate that you use. You go. You're also going to know is there any risk that you might not pay, and it, there might be some other liquidity factors also. So that is the five elements of present value uh, valuation. Now, this is called the traditional approach of calculating the present value. The traditional approach means now the only difference between a traditional approach and a present present cash flow approach is in the traditional approach we use one discount rate. I mean, I'm going to have uh, you know cash flows at present value. I'm going to pay you from 65 to 80. So to discount all those cash flows, I'll use one discount rate. But in the expected cash flow method, I will use what rate might be in the year 65 and what rate might be in the year 65. And if there's any risk also and all that stuff. So that so basically expected cash flow methods will also take into account variations in discount rates and any other risk associated with making those payments on all this stuff. So, so that, that is how you uh, do that. So that completes us module one. Now, after each module, we have, uh, you know, conceptual frameworks and it tells you completeness is an ingredient of which, which, uh, uh, which one relevance or faithful representation. So, uh, so that's how, how we, you know, we, we, ta we tackle that. So can, can somebody answer this question? Completeness. B, it would be B. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, okay, on this chapter, I just want to, you know, I'll just, I mean, one thing about all this uh, CPA course content is that you're tested on everything, but, uh, but uh, there are weightages. Weightages means you're going to get a question on this chapter and module one. It's going to be a one point question. It, it is just a one point question. So there are some modules where you could get a, you could get a simulation question, which could be worth seven points or 10 points and all the stuff. So this particular chapter is a uh, one pointer and you can just go through all the concepts here. Okay. Now we come to uh, the second module, which is basically we're talking of income statement now. So income statement, you know that now whenever we talk of income statement, the first thing that you learned in the last chapter was revenues and expenditures, gains and losses. Okay, revenues are gross and they're operating. Expenses are gross, they're operating. Gains and losses are non-operating and they're net amounts. <clears throat> So we, we look at an income statement to determine what is the profitability of that uh, company. And you know, what is the credit uh, worthiness and all that stuff. Okay, now, as I mentioned to you, you know, we, we have, we record expenditures uh, either as assets or expenses. Now, if a particular uh, expenditure benefits a period of more than one year, it is an asset. So inventory is, a, is an asset. Why is it an asset? Because till you sell it, you have not generated any revenue. It is a current asset because you expect to sell it within one year. What is the, so you will record inventory as a current asset on your balance sheet. What, what part of inventory is recorded in the income statement? Cost of goods sold, right? Did you get it? You know inventories, right? Okay, opening inventory plus purchases minus cost of goods sold is closing inventory. So if firstly, when I when I buy inventory, I'm recording it as a current asset on my balance sheet. 
suppose i buy 10000 dollars of uh, of merchandise of raw material so i record it as 10000 on my current assets in in the inventory now i convert my raw material to finished goods you know i add overheads i convert it to finished goods and i sell 50% of that so 50% of 10000 is 5000 so that is my cost of goods sold now where does that go sales is 10000 cost of goods sold is 5000 so expired cost of inventory is the cost of goods sold what about insurance if i pay 3 years of insurance the expired cost is the cost of current year what is the expired cost of uh, fixed assets depreciation expired cost of patents is is amortization now you know we we depreciate fixed as uh, tangible assets we amortize intangible assets like patents and uh, all the stuff okay so as i mentioned to you revenues and expenditures are are operating and their gross concepts we discussed that and uh, net con uh, gains and losses are net concepts and we only record the uh, record the item here okay okay so previously this is also a change now uh, previously you know we had extraordinary items that were presented uh, separately but that is out now we don't have anything like extraordinary items in the income statement anymore okay now this is uh, this is a very important chapter you get a lot of questions on this this is uh, also um, also in, you know in addition to multiple choice questions you could also get an essay type question basically there are they'll give you various situations and ask and tell you to prepare an income statement okay so we have we have uh, you know i mean you know how how we uh, make our entries you know we got general entries as soon as we incur any transaction we make a general entry and then we do uh, uh, at the end of the year we make adjusting entries we come to an adjusted trial balance so this one example one you see a trial balance all revenue items and all liabilities are credit balances and all assets and all expenditures are debit balances so here this trial balance lists down all the balances at the end of the year for all uh, revenue gains losses assets liabilities we use the trial balance to prepare an income statement and a balance sheet okay now in this particular case if you look if you look at this one here so we got sales now you can combine them you can put them separately also you know your total revenue could be revenue from sale of goods revenue from services revenue from rental so if you look at the sales revenue was 380 sales return was 30 and sales discount was 5 now always remember that whenever you prepare an income statement you do not show sales return and sales discount separately you net them off so from your sale of sale of goods your net revenue is 350 then you got sales re service revenue of 200 and you got rental revenue of 100 so in a multiple step income statement multiple step income statement what you've firstly done is you've taken all your revenues and then you have taken the cost of that revenue the cost of that revenue is your goods services and rental so all that cost of goods sold cost of services sold cost of rental is 410 like 250 150 plus uh, 60 so how much is that that is 410 now if you see this there are certain even when you're presenting your income statement, you have to show gross profit and net profit. Now, gross profit means operating profit. So your operating profit is 650 minus 410. So your gross margin, which is basically called your operating profit, is 240. Then you got other expenditures, selling expenditures, general administration, depreciation. Now, when we talk of depreciation, we're talking of depreciation on non manufacturing assets because if you have manufacturing asset that will go into cost of goods sold all the all the overheads of manufacturing equipment goes to cost of goods sold 
so if 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 they give, if if the question gives you that okay there was a depreciation of ten thousand dollars on on the manufacturing machinery, and then there was a depreciation of uh, three thousand dollars on on uh, old factory building, so the three thousand would go under after gross margin, and the ten thousand would go as a part of cost of goods sold because it is manufacturing. So then you come up with what is called income or loss from operations. So what you've seen up, what you've seen up to this point is that you will break your all your revenues and expenses into operating and non operating. You will come up from operating. You will determine your gross profit, and after that you'll take the non operate. Uh, you'll do, uh, do the other expenditures and come up with operations also. Okay, then you show all gains and losses. So gains and losses are always shown separately because they are not operating, they are non-operating, and they are they are presented at net amounts. So I will show gains, I will show losses, and I will show uh, other losses and loss of sale of fixed asset. Now, if you if you look at this part of the section, there are two things that stand out. So loss on the sale of a security, loss on a a sale of a fixed asset or a gain on a sale of fixed asset are all presented separately. But interest revenue and interest expenses are also presented in this part. So under US GAAP, in the income statement, you always have to show your interest revenue and interest expenses separately. You cannot combine it with sales. You cannot combine it with expenses. You always have to show it separately. And then you have, if there are any unusual items which happen very rarely or sometimes, you will show that separately. So after all this is done, you come up with what is called the total income before income tax, which is a hundred. And then you calculate the income tax expense on that. So net sales minus cost of sales is your gross profit or your operating profit minus selling general administration, non depreciation, non manufacturing depreciation. You come on income from operations, you take gains, losses, and trust revenue and interest expenses. You come up with total income and then you calculate your income tax and you come up with what is called net income, net income after income tax. Now, in case this is, this is, uh, you will not use the terminology net income if you have discontinued operations. Well, so basically, if a company decides, I'm just going to tell you this one here. Suppose if a company decides to discontinue operations in China, they will be presented separately. It will not come under the total of net income. Okay, so we will we will discuss this discontinued operations, you know, in a, in a more next module. So now, whenever you have any kind of discontinued operations, you will not use the terminology net income. You will use the terminology income from continuing operations. And then you will show discontinued operations after that. So, so, so how will it look then? Suppose I have discontinued. I'm going to give you two situations. I don't have discontinued operations. My income statement will look like this. Net income, net sales, Minus cost of sales is gross profit, minus selling expenditures, general administration, depreciation is income from operations, gains, losses, interest revenue, interest expenses is my net income. Finished. I don't have discontinued operations. If I have discontinued operations, I will not use the terminology net income. I will use uh, income from continuing operations. And below that, I will put discontinued operations, and then I will come to net income. So whenever I have discontinued operations, the terminal, the presentation would be income from continuing operations, discontinued operations, and the total of both of that will call, will be called net income. Okay. Now what is included in inventory? Inventory is basically all the purchase price of the raw material, the price and any freight in uh, for goods to come in. If there's any transportation charges, you'll include that. Selling expenditures are freight, salaries, commissions, advertising, general administration are accounting, legal insurance, and anything non-operating and all this stuff is that. 
okay we have single step income statement you know very few firms uh, which some some doctors or some companies uh, are allowed to operate under the cash method uh, and they use a single step method so whenever you have single step method basically you put all the revenues together all the expenditures together you do not break it up into gross profit and net profit so this is how you do a single step method you hardly asked any question on this one here at all okay it's a very simple method but it's used for people who mostly use the cash basis now we come come to the balance sheet so balance sheet is something which reflects all the uh, assets of a company and all the liabilities of a company and, and the way we show your assets is we always start up with most liquid to least liquid so if you look at the asset sides we got cash and cash equivalent now cash equivalents are combined with cash and presented as one figure what is cash equivalent is something a marketable instrument with the maturity of less than 3 months original maturity of less than 3 months is as good as cash included in that amount we got trading securities now in marketable securities you know we, we have uh, three categories of securities we got trading held to maturity and available for sale securities but trading securities are current current assets because you want to trade in them regularly every year accounts receivable are presented at the net amount notes receivable inventory prepaid expenses these are all current asset then you have investments and investments can be held to maturity available for sale these are non current property plan and all marketable securities trading available for sale and held to held not held to maturity we'll talk of that are presented at fair market value accounts receivable is presented at net amount uh, and uh, this property plant and equipment are non current assets they are presented net of accumulated depreciation but presented at historical amount intangible assets are again historical amount presented net of amortization and then we have other assets also then on the liability side we got current liabilities which are you know long term debt current portion accounts payable notes payable interest payable salaries long term liabilities and then we got long term liabilities and the difference between all these assets and liabilities is total shareholders equity now shareholders equity is divided into various categories we got we got capital stock now remember when we when we talk of capital stock this is basically investment by owners we can have preferred stock now what is the what is what is the preferred stock basically you will pay a dividend on the stock first before you distribute your earnings now preferred stock is a hybrid uh, hybrid instrument why do we call it a hybrid instrument why do we call preferred stock a hybrid instrument because it can also be a liability and i'll, I'll explain you why okay now preferred stock so a uh, say i i am a preferred stock holder i have a share of 10 dollars 8% cumulative dividend which basically means cumulative means whether i whether the company makes money or does not make money this preferred stock holder is entitled to an 8% dividend okay and so that is cumulative non participating means it doesn't participate in the remaining retained earnings okay so why are they called uh, a hybrid instrument because preferred stock can also be redeemable a preferred stock holder can go back to the company and say that i want to surrender my preferred stock so it is kind of a liability so those are so preferred stocks can be cumulative which means you always get your 8% dividend non cumulative means if you don't have profit this year you don't get it you won't get it again it can be participating participating means after paying the dividend whatever is still left as a profit is shared with the common shareholders by the preferred stockholders non participating means it's not shared now common stockholders are you know when we when we talk of common stockholders we have authorized capital authorized capital means how many how many shares is this company entitled to sell now so that is the total number of shares 600 million shares this company is allowed to sell issued shares means out of these shares how much has been issued to the company to the public 57 million 598000 
what is why that what is outstanding 57178485 is outstanding out of the issued shares this company bought back certain shares so your outstanding shares are issued shares minus what the company has bought back and those are called treasury shares so the difference between 57598 and 57178485 are treasury shares okay and all common stock is reflected at par value anything over par value is called additional paid in capital now this is other comprehensive income you know when we discussed of co comprehensive income the this is called other comprehensive income now you know you looked at we just did multiple step income statement we did the single step income statement nowhere on the income statement did you see anything called other comprehensive income right and the reason why you didn't see other comprehensive income in the income statement is because other comprehensive income does not go into the income statement it goes it is recorded in the shareholders equity account it is recorded in the shareholders equity account it is like a income with non owners not not to be reflected but it increases the net worth of the owners that is why it is presented in the shareholders equity account so just remember that other comprehensive income is not a part of income statement it is a part of shareholders equity account okay so that was exposure to the income statement and the balance sheet okay scott corporation sold a fixed asset used for operations for greater than its selling uh, selling amount how would you re where would you record it so you want to look at the answers and tell me what you think anybody can can somebody uh, try to attempt it like one of you any anybody uh, take a lead and uh, why didn't you attempt it hello i think b that concept is part of continuing operations okay and d is right okay first thing that i'm you know d first thing you have to uh, when we analyze this question fixed assets used for the operations you are selling fixed assets okay now a sale of a fixed asset is not an operating activity so it is a gain right so you will not consider it as a revenue or expenditure you will consider it as a gain gain or loss second thing is we know that all gains and losses are presented at the net net amount so the answer is net amount and now we know that because it is it is connected with the business it is not a part of comprehensive income which is b and it is not a part of discontinued operations which is c so it is a part of continuing operations and it is not net of taxes because taxes are deducted separately now one thing about d can can when you say net concept showing the total gain as a part of continuing operations not net of taxes why what what does d also indicate to you something from d which you can infer you can make make a conclusion okay let me let me let me let me tell you say if i if i reworded the answer d saying that net concept showing the total gain as net income not net of taxes would that have been right or wrong that would be right right 
it's not an income actually uh, i mean it is an income no 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 now if you go back to the income statement okay you know that total gains and losses are a part of net income right yeah okay we had let, let me let me just uh, repicturize the income statement in your mind we had net sales minus cost of sales was gross profit we had general administration selling expenses we came up to operating income then we had gains and losses and we came up to uh, net income before taxes and then we had taxes and then we had net income okay now we don't use the terminology net income when we have discontinued operations exactly so this line d Im implies that because he's using the word continuing operations it means there is some discontinued operations after that and if suppose if there was no discontinued operations you would have put net in net concept showing the total gain as a part oh, of in as a part of net income before income taxes right okay right okay so that is how how you would go up. okay secondly which one of the following should be included in general administrative expenses again d both are uh, not a part of general administration exactly interest is presented separately and uh, and this one uh, advertising being a part of sales expenses yes exactly okay so that that is what uh, this answer is okay so uh, now we come to a very important concept you know this is tested every time income statement revenue recognitions are two parts where which are very very heavily tested on the cp examination now revenue recognition occurs when an entity satisfies certain obligations they transfer the goods they perform the services certain contracts are done there are no guarantees so under us cap there are five steps of revenue recognition identify the contract with the customer so the key thing when we say identify the contract i'll give you one example your entire revenue recognition will depend upon the terms of your contract uh when we say they depend on the term of the contract suppose if i have a contract called um uh i will supply you goods which are subject to inspection by you for inspection by you okay so if i ship goods to somebody and that person has inspected them and approved them then it is revenue for me why because my contract states that right is it clear yeah okay so you look at the contract to determine revenue okay. another contract example of a, a term in the contract would be is the shipment fob or cif fo you, you understand fob and cif fob means freight on board cif means carriage insurance and freight okay if i if my contract says that this is all my sale of goods is under the fob the minute i put my goods on a truck i recognize revenue because that is what the contract states if the contract states that it is cif which means carriage insurance and freight i am responsible for the transportation charges for the insurance and for the freight so and it is a destination contract until they reach you i am responsible for everything suppose during it is a caf contract and something happens to the goods in the uh, the goods get destroyed on the way i cannot recognize that revenue because it is a caf contract secondly you separate the performance separate performance obligations of the contract what do we mean by separate performance obligations of the contract
basically you know i might sell you uh, i give you one example i might sell you uh, c- computer hardware for $400,000 and i will also say that i will maintain uh, i will do the maintenance for this hardware for the next 5 years so this particular sale includes two components one is the sale of hardware and the other one is the maintenance of the hardware so you have to separate those two contracts determine the transaction price how much is the price for the total price uh, a total price then allocate the price between the sale price and the maintenance price and recognize revenue uh, recognize revenue when the obligation is completed so when is obligation completed when i sell the merchandise to you the ownership has passed the computer hardware ownership has passed to you i will recognize revenue from the sale of that hardware after all the risk and the ownership has passed so that part will be recognized immediately but what about maintenance revenue maintenance revenue will be recognized over 5 years right because it is a 5 year maintenance contract that i have with you did you get it yeah perfect okay let, let, let me put it in some numbers here suppose i sell you my computer hardware for $100000 and it includes the sale of hardware plus uh, maintenance for 5 years the maintenance is $10000 the hardware is $90000 so i identify the different uh, price uh, for each for each uh, activity as soon as i transfer the hardware to you the risk has passed to you ownership has passed to you i've complied with all the terms of the contract i will recognize uh, revenue of 90000 from the sale of hardware now the 10000 uh, maintenance revenue one year has lapsed i will only recognize one fifth of that as revenue though i've got the money so i will only recognize revenue of $2000 what about the remaining $8000 where will i show that hello where will i show that unearned revenue unearned revenue yeah it is either deferred revenue Or you can defer defer revenue or unearned revenue it will be shown as a liability on my balance sheet under the current liability section because i have received that money i have not received it is not revenue as yet okay so you got this concept of revenue recognition everybody is clear right so identify the contract with the customer here you know all parties have to be identified what are the terms of the contract now if you look at this one this example here on march 1st building entered into contract to transfer a product and will pay the full contract price to building on august 1st building transfer the product on uh, september 1st and the total cost was 9 now look at look at what happened in this particular thing uh, okay the contract was for 15000 which was entered on march 1st year 1 there was no exchange it was just a contract so there will be no entry made on march 1st on august 1st i was paid $15000 is it revenue why is it not revenue on august 1st because the goods have not been transferred okay until i transfer the goods and the ownership that it is not recognized so it is classified as deferred revenue so i get i debit cash and i credit unearned revenue in september 1st i transfer the goods now unearned revenue will become revenue so i will debit unearned revenue credit sales revenue and then i will calculate cost of goods sold i will reduce my inventory by 9000 because to sell 15000 my cost was 9000 so i'll do cost of goods sold to inventory everybody understands the general entries is this clear yes 
Did you understand this whole concept? Yep, all of it. Any questions on this? You can ask me as we go along. If 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 you if you're not sure or anything, just just be, be feel totally free to ask me. Anybody? Okay, let me let me uh, just uh, ask another question. I enter into a contract on January first with a garment shopkeeper to sell him ten thousand dollars worth of clothing. Will I make any entry on January first? Yes or no? No. Okay, because there's no exchange. No. It's just a contract. On March 31st, I ship my goods to the uh, garment manufacturer. Ship my goods to the garment manufacturer uh, and uh, and he accepts it. What entry will I make? I've not received any money. I've shipped the goods to him. He's accepted it. What entry will I make? What general entry? Receivable to goods. Exactly. Receivable to sales. Right? Sales revenue. Is that clear? I've sold you the merchandise. The ownership is passed to the person. <clears throat> Whether he pays me or doesn't pay me, I recognize that revenue. Is that clear? <clears throat> so the entry will be accounts receivable to sales revenue. He pays me in March. Uh, he pays me after one month. What will I do? What entry will I make for that? Cash to receivable. Cash to receivable, exactly. And then it cost me seven thousand dollars to make a sale of ten thousand. What entry will I make for that? Um, cost to uh, inventory. Yeah. Cost mm -hmm. of goods sold to inventory. I will reduce my inventory by seven thousand. So this mm -hmm. entry is clear. Now, in this same example, suppose if he had paid me before I shipped the goods, I would I would make this entry as cash to unearned revenue. Is that clear? Yes, perfect. Okay. So basically revenue is when the risks pass and all the stuff. If there's any contract modification, uh, you know, if you know if you change the contract and there's a modification or a new coin it is it is treated as a new contract if it in, if it changes you know like uh, i change my contract it's a new contract then if it has a major compact on it and then secondly secondly is that you know you you distinguish between uh, you identify the performance obligations of a contract is it sale of goods it is sale of services uh, things like that just like what i did what i discussed with you that sale of a computer hardware versus a plus maintenance also. So in this example that we have, this they sold a particular license, uh, software. Uh, so you saw, you sold the software license. You had the install software license revenue, installation revenue, any updates and technical support. Then you determine the total price of the contract, and then you allocate the price to the various components uh, components and all the stuff here 
and uh, so basically you have to allocate the contract price to the sale of software to the installation services to any updates and all the stuff okay now just let's do this time value of money and you will you will calculate that if i sell you something for four thousand dollars and i tell you and i tell you to pay me after four years is my revenue four thousand or less Uh, less no, exactly because i'm giving you interest free uh, sale so what i will do is i will discount my 4000 and i will calculate how much is the interest component on that so my revenue will only be 3175 the remaining will be my interest revenue okay you can go through that example okay so then next one was you know you allocate the transaction price between the various components Okay, so you know, standalone selling price basically it means that you know uh, sometimes you cannot differentiate between the allocation price and all that stuff, and sometimes you can. Now, in this particular example that we have, so we got software license, we got installation services, we got technical services. Now the total contract was sold for two fifty, but independently the license was one sixty, installation was twenty. Technical support was 90. So what you have to do is because these are separate separate elements of a contract, you have to break it down. So you 160 over 270, 20 over 270, and 90 over 270 multiply by the total price of 250. You allocate software license revenue at 148, installation at 18, and technical support at 83. Now software license, as soon as you transfer the ownership, you'll recognize the revenue. Installation service charge as soon as the installation is delivered and earned that one technical support revenue will be recognized over three years so these are the general entries for that now look at the general entry here cash 250 i sold i got 250 license revenue i've recognized immediately because the ownership has passed installation revenue i've recognized immediately because i've installed it unearned revenue the minute i got this money I had not done any service. So at that stage, I will recognize 83,000 as unearned revenue. At the end of the year, one third of that will be recognized as revenue because the technical support is for three years. So unearned revenue to service revenue for 23,148. Okay, so then uh, we have Then we have, you know, basically performance at at a particular time and over time. So just like just like I said that, you know, if we uh, if I come and uh, wash your car, it is at a particular time. I wash your car. I've done my job. I earn revenue. If I say that I will uh, uh, wash your car for the whole year, uh, and you pay me for the whole year in advance, it is over a period of time. I cannot recognize revenue immediately. I'll have to spread it over the period of time also. <clears throat> so now uh, over a period of time, you know, it can be based upon how time it can be based upon uh, how much resources I use and uh, how much, what are the input methods and all that stuff. So like say if I, if I, if I say that I pay you, uh, $20,000 to deliver me 10,000 uh, shirts over the over the whole year so it's over a, over a period of time now the shirts could be the could be based on how much are shipped to you which is the output method or it could be based upon how much expenditures i incur to manufacture those shirts so th those are over time and particular time they're not very important concept 
again you know just like uh, uh, deferred revenue here also we have a receivable if you have a contract you have a receivable and then you have you recognize revenues and uh, similarly uh, if you have a receivable it is a current asset and uh, if you have received money and you have not delivered the goods or the merchandise it is a deferred revenue and it is a liability okay for 50 dollars a month ravel visits his cusper premium performs uh, insect uh, you know control verification if the customer experiences problems originally scheduled with ravel makes service calls at no addition instead of paying monthly the customer pays an annual fees of 540 in advance how would you recognize that, that as revenue so this is 550 for insect control inspections over the whole year so you will you will you recognize revenue when it is collected at the end of the year or as it as it is performed or over evenly over the service years as the services are performed so basically you have to what is the answer here evenly evenly recorded over the exactly it has to be evenly recorded over the period okay uh, on august 1st uh, signed a contract that entailed providing a specialized piece of equipment for this much with delivery expected to occur on this much per the term will pay lender the full amount on july 8th. so can you can can you look at the, read this question a bit uh, carefully and then uh, let's discuss the answer Again, a question like this is very, very important that you read what is required. Assuming delivery occurs as expected on August 31st, general entry for London will involve which of the following debits and credits? So we're talking of, on what date are we talking of? August 31st. Okay. When is cash collected? Uh, july july so credit to cash to 215 is number one we never have a credit to cash we always have a debit to cash so that is right and even the date is wrong debit to inventory in august 31st when the sale was made was it a debit to inventory or a credit to inventory it would have been a credit to inventory because you, your your inventory was sold on that day, right? So B is wrong also. Credit to cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold never has a credit balance. It's an expense, it has a debit balance. So the answer is D. Debit to unearned sales revenue of 2115. Did everybody get that figure? Okay, let me let me let me make general entries for you on this one here. On April 15th, year three, London signed a contract which entailed providing specialized piece of equipment for 215. So there is no entry on April 15. With delivery expected dispatch. Per the terms of the contract, uh, Jacob will pay the full amount on July 31st. So on July 31st, what is the entry? Debit cash, 215,000. Credit what? Unearned revenue because the goods have not been de de uh, delivered so it'll be debit cash credit earned on revenue of 215 and then uh, on august 31st the entry uh, the goods were delivered so the entry would be debit earned on revenue credit revenue by 215 so which is the which is answer d debit earned on revenue credit entry what about 175 175 would be <coughs> 
debit cost of goods sold on August 31st and credit inventory of 175. These are the four entries. Everybody got those entries? Is everybody clear or not? Yes. On. Okay. So that brings us to first part of revenue recognition. The second part of revenue recognition is incremental costs. Uh, you know, if you if you incur some costs to obtain a contract, like legal costs or commissions to sale employees, uh, those are all included as a cost of revenue. Traveling is goes in is not a part of revenue. Anything. Any additional costs incurred are also as a part of cost of goods sold. Except travel, eh? Like say, if I if I have to register a particular uh, patent before I sell it, it is a cost to sell that. So it will be it will be uh, you know exp expenditures for that. But if I travel to a particular place, that is a selling uh, a uh, selling and administration expenses. So cost to fulfill a contract, you know, the additional workstation should be recognized an asset under this, which you can remember. Now, what about uh, principal and agent? If an agent makes sale for you, it is your revenue. If an agent does not make sale for you, okay, so the the entity controls the goods before it is transferred to the customer revenue recognized is equal to the gross consideration uh, an entity uh, is it revenue recognized is equal to the fees or commission for performing the function so is this is this part a bit clear to you i have an agent who sells goods for me okay i i supply say 10,000 uh, worth of stock to the agent. Will I, will I recognize it as revenue or not? No. Okay. It depends. It depends on a couple of things. If I can estimate on a very predictable basis that the agent will be able to sell 90% of those goods, and collection is not uncertain. I will be able to collect it. I will recognize 90% of that revenue immediately when I transfer the goods to the agent. If, if the agent is unable to fulfill all those conditions, then I will only recognize revenue once the agent sells, right? So what is the revenue to the agent? The revenue to the agent is only the commission that he gets. So that is the revenue to the agent. Okay, so uh, principal and agent, you know, you, you can read that also. Now, what is a repurchase agreement? I will sell you the goods and if you don't sell it, you can give it back to me. I will buy it back from you. So until the goods are sold, I will not, I will not recognize it as revenue. You, you know, forward and call, call options. What is a forward and a call option? What is a call? What is a call option? You know futures? Right. Yeah. Futures. Okay. We have hedging instruments in the form of future contracts, call options, uh, put options. Uh, so basically these all uh, future contracts are to reduce your risk. A call option is an option to buy. I enter into a call option to buy the particular stock or particular goods from a buyer after six months. The reason I buy, I enter into a call option today is because I might, I think that the price of the goods after six months will be much higher. To protect myself against the increase in the price, I will buy a call option today. Similarly, I have a put option. Put option is to sell. Why will I why will I enter into a put option to sell today? The price drops, you can sell it at a higher rate. Exactly, because I feel that the price after six months will be lower, so I will sell out, I will sell the uh, sell a put option so I can get the price that I hold. <coughs> now bill and uh, bill and hold arrangements. 
so basically you know you you the the revenue will only be recognized once you know you you uh, fulfill the conditions and you'll hold the merchandise and if you sell it so basically the contract will determine what when revenue will be recognized and cost to, oh, this one we discussed sale on consignment consignment is never revenue if i give my goods on consignment to somebody and is unable to sell it uh, it is not revenue now warranties what is what do you what do you mean by warranty i sell my much i sell say i sell a car to you and i also provide your warranty at that point point of sale what what does warranty mean if anything goes wrong with the car in the first 2 years or first 50000 kilometers i will repair it free of cost so how do you book warranty expenses and when do you book them up i have a question here so warranty and guarantee are treated in the same manner are they accounted in the same manner i thought they are two different uh, items here where where okay. did it get where is the guarantee part of it in this it's not on this it just hit my mind i thought warranty is something where we'll fix it so it's only the damage which we'll fix but guarantee is something where we'll buy it back or we'll take it back and give them something you know like a replacement no no repurchase uh, when when you guarantee to buy it back it is never uh, it is never uh, uh, revenue till uh, till the other person sells it so it, it uh, so if i guarantee to buy the goods back it means that okay i sell you i, I transfer certain goods to uh, to a person and i guarantee to buy it back it is not revenue till that person sells it okay but warranties let's let's come to warranties say i sell you a car and i say that i will i will repair it free of cost for the next 2 years so when is revenue recognized uh probably evenly throughout the years like if there is no uh, claims then you would split it equally no no, no, no. let's let's no, no that's wrong and uh, I'll, i'll i'll tell you uh, Okay. Let's 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 analyze this question. I sell you a I sell you a car for fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. I transfer the car to you. So revenue is rec. This is a, this is an event taking place on a specific date and not over time. So revenue is recognized when the car gets transferred to you. Right? Yeah. That is gross revenue. Okay. but against that revenue <coughs> i i also give you as a part of that sale i also say that i will <coughs> repair your car free of cost for the next 2 years so what do i do to that that part of that that part of that uh, warranty which i give you yeah i think on the on that cost is what i was saying we could we'll have to probably do it evenly throughout the year so first year half of it would be uh, uh recognize and half the no. next year no no the answer is like this the answer is not evenly because this is a particular event that is taking place on a particular date when the car is transferred the entire revenue is recognized on the date when the car gets transferred so similarly the entire warranty expenses will be recognized on the same date okay okay so what so what is the what what entry would you do okay this is the entry that suppose i'll, I'll tell you one thing i'll say uh, i sell you $50000 and you've paid me $50000 so the my, my entry will be cash $50000 to sales revenue $50000 on january 1st 2020 
on january 1st 2020 when i sell you that car i will also i have also provided you warranty provisions if anything goes wrong with the car i will repair it free of cost for two years now i will estimate i will go back and look at the history and say that five percent is my approximate cost of warranties so 50 fifty thousand multiplied by five percent is two thousand five hundred so i will make on january 1st 2020 i will make a provision for warranty expenses so what is the what is the entry that i will do warranty expenses warranty expense debit to warranties payable 2500 so i've i've recognized i've recognized the expense immediately and i have set up a liability of 2500 on january 1st now on december 31st i the guy brought in his car and i sp i repaired it for a cost of 1500 dollars so the entry i will make on december 31st will be warrant is payable debit to cash cash is going out 1500 dollars i will reduce my payable from 25 to 1500 next year i spend another 1000 i will reduce it to another 1000 is that clear yep makes sense the warranty expense will be recognized immediately when the sale takes place refund liabilities and right to return so basically if you have a right to return it is not it is a liability okay uh, jojo roasters manufactures and sells beans and uh, bill and hold arrangement so this this question you want to do that jo manufactured and sell into an agreement to manufacture roasters the roasters were manufactured and were completed on this day due to the delays in the construction agree to maintain the roasters in a sep until the uh, january this much october 1 on which on which date can jojo recognize the revenue from bill and hold arrangement <clears throat> you know do you understand what is a bill and a hold arrangement Okay, what do, what do you mean? Firstly, what do you understand by the word bill and hold arrangement? I'll, I'll tell you, I get an order. In this case, uh, I get an order to manufacture coffee bean roasters and hold them. I will manufacture the bean roasters for you and I will hold them. I will not deliver them to you for whatever reason, because my factory is not ready or I don't have space to this. So that is called a bill and hold arrangement that as soon as now, whenever a person gives you a bill and hold arrangement and his goods have been manufactured and are specifically meant for that customer and you are holding those goods in your warehouse, you recognize revenue as soon as the goods are manufactured and put on one corner in your factory. Is it clear? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So, the, because it is, it is a bill and hold arrangement, that's what, okay. So the next chapter will be, now in the first one, sales return, because you can estimate 10% of the return will be, so like I sell my goods to an agent and I feel that only 10% will be returned. <coughs> so I will debit cash, I will recognize a liability of 10%, uh, 5,000, and I'll recognize sales revenue of 45,000. So now this is for long-term contracts. As I mentioned to you, uh, we have two methods of revenue recognition. One is percentage of completion method and the other one is completed contract method. Now percentage of completion method, you can estimate the profitability, you can estimate the cost of completion and you will recognize it as and when it takes place. Uh, so, uh, very very simply uh, you know this whole percentage of completion method uh, can be explained by looking at this example eight so here what what i have is i have a contract the contract price is four thousand dollars the 
total estimated cost of the contract is 3000 and so what is what is my profit i'm going to i'm going to construct a building for you for 4000 it's going to cost me 3000 my estimated profit profit is 1000 okay how much of that revenue of 1000 do i recognize in the first year percentage of completion method means what is the cost incurred in first one year the cost incurred in first year is 1500 and the total costs are 300 3000 so 50% of the costs have been incurred in uh, in the first year so 50% of the profit will be in, uh, recognized in the first year so 1000 is my profit estimated profit 500 will be recognized in the first year now you go to the second year second year what happens is uh, my cost uh, my profit is 800 okay 400 my costs have gone up to 3200 what is the total cost i've incurred up to date 2400 what is the total cost 3200 75 percent has been completed so what is my percentage of completion 75 so out of a total profit of 800 75 is recognized 600 is uh, the total profit but i've already recognized 500 in the first year so in the second year i will only recognize 100 is that clear is this is this example clear yes so percentage of completion method is just remember that on the contract you calculate the total profit uh, and that profit is allocated in the first year based on how much costs have already incurred to total costs in the second year i do cumulative how much i've incurred to total cost i deduct what i what profit i've recognized in year one and then i take take the balance in year two and whenever you have a loss whenever you have a loss you recognize the full loss in the third year and if there are any additional costs in year four you recognize that any any question on this completed contract method uh, so just remember that percentage of completion method your profit is allocated based on cost incurred in that year over total estimated costs and you do it every year because your costs keep on accumulating in year two you will take the total cost of year one year two and take it over the total cost and uh, whatever has been allocated to year one you will deduct that is that clear okay you know in this classes i mean you know we've exposed you to all these concepts your understanding and your full uh, uh, comprehension will only work if you go and do your homework every day so you are required to read this chapter again and then practice all the multiple choice questions at home so every uh, before you come for the next class you are required to put in at least uh, 14 15 hours of homework at home so completed contract method is totally different and because the reason is the word completed contract method is i do not recognize any revenue till the contract is completed and the reason for that is because it is difficult to estimate what the cost is there is a lot of inflation there are a lot of things so similarly like in a completed contract method <coughs> if somebody pays me money i will reckon i will i will show it as a liability right why, why will i show it as a liability because i'm not entitled to that money till the contract is completed so these are these are the uh, terminologies that you have we have construction in progress to materials construction the accounts receivable to progress billing on the contract and until the contract is completed you will not recognize any revenue at all under the completed contract method Haft Construction Company has consistently used a percentage of completion method, income recognized in year one, costs incurred. What, what amount of gross profit should uh, have to report in year two?
So can somebody answer this question? That's B three hundred thousand and everybody's got three hundred thousand. Okay, let's 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 quickly. Yeah, that is the right answer. So the total contract price is three million. My total costs initially were two point two five, but then they were because I had additional costs. So the tot the total cost was eighteen hundred plus six hundred twenty four hundred. So my total profit over the two years was six hundred thousand. I recognize three hundred thousand in year one, so in year two it will be three hundred thousand. So that is the right answer. Second one. Uh, Begin construction of project scheduled to completion. The overall losses are anticipated at contract completion. What would be the effect of project one operating income under US cap percentage of completion, uh, completion and completed contract method? Basically, under the percentage of completion method, you recognize revenue as you go along. <clears throat> so oh, the, the question is, what would be the effect of the project on year one operating income? If I see an, if I anticipate a loss in year two, then I will recognize the loss immediately. So my operating income revenue will decrease under percentage of completion method. Under the completed contract method, it will have no effect and because the uh, income is not even recognized till the project is completed. So the answer here is uh, C, a decrease and no, Im no impact at all. Okay, so we, we will uh, we'll just take a two minute break. Is it okay? Hello? Yeah, sure, no problem. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be back in uh, two minutes. We'll all take a two minute break and then we'll go to discontinued operations.
Hello, hello. You all back? You all back there? Hello. Yep, I'm here. Okay, we're gonna start now again. So, um, you know, when we were doing income statement, we mentioned that if a company has any any kind of discontinued operations it has to be reported separately so it cannot be a part of uh, income from continuing operations and we use the definition income from continuing operations only when we have discontinued operations so what is number one it should be a part of entity so the key thing about discontinued operations is to, uh, two very important things about discontinued operations is it is presented separately from continued operations and it is presented net net uh, on the net amount we do not include sales and expenses separately and all we show it as a net amount and also we show it as a net amount net of taxes so the taxes are not shown separately the amount shown for discontinued operations is on a net amount net of taxes now, what is classified as a discontinued operation? It should be an, a part of an entity. It can be a segment. It can be a geographical region. It can be an asset. It can be a particular operating division. Uh, and it should be it should be a non-operating activity. You are you are intending to uh, close that division. Secondly, it is based upon a decision taken by the management. The management decides to discontinue operations in China. It is discontinued. Management commits to it. It should uh, commit to a plan to sell that. Um, uh, it should be available for sale immediately. And the management should not have any involvement after it is sold. Then it so basically it should be held for sale and you should make efforts to sell it. And only then it is classified as discontinued operations. <clears throat> So it is either sold or it is held for sale. So it can be a geographical area. It can be an equity, It can be an investment. It can be a particular line of business, etc. So this now when so because we are reporting discontinued operations separately. Now what is what is included in discontinued operations? Number one, remember that we are talking of either a segment or a geographical region, or, or we're talking of a product line. I'll give you one example. Say, suppose I 
decide to abandon my operations in China. Everything for that China operation will be discontinued. Second example, suppose I decide to get out of the clothing business. I, everything about the clothing business will be discontinued operations. So discontinued operations are presented net, net of taxes also. Now discontinued operations are broken up into three parts. Results from operations, gain and loss on disposal and impairment loss. So whenever I have discontinued operations, what I will do is I will calculate what are the what is the gains and losses on that operation from operating from from, from that you know when I get when I try to get out of the clothing business I still have certain inventory I will sell them I will have certain expenses that is operations what is disposal so discovery operations has three parts operations disposal and impairment so what is disposal that particular segment has assets and liabilities. I will try to sell those. And any gains and losses will be in, in this part. What is impairment? Impairment is the fair market value, the fall in the fair market value of all the assets and liabilities in a particular period. The total of all these will be included in discontinued operations. And remember that we always present them net of taxes. Uh, let, let me let me give one example. Suppose uh, I had inventory of ten thousand. I sold it for ten thousand. The cost was eight thousand. So how will I present it? And the tax rate is thirty percent. So my discontinued loss on operations will be ten minus eight, two thousand. Net 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 concept. Net of taxes less forty percent taxes. Uh, 800 so my loss on operations will be presented at 1200 net amount net of taxes similarly i will present my loss on loss or gain on disposal net amount net of taxes impairment loss or gain net amount net of let, net of taxes and if there's a subsequent increase in fair market value but you can book it as income uh, but not beyond the original amount. So whenever you have discontinued operations, you will stop taking depreciation on the fixed assets. You will not take into account any anticipated gains or losses. Only the ones that occur in that period you will take into concept. Okay, so let's let's take this example, uh, and you'll probably understand it. Huh? The trial balance below represents income statement of year one from all supports company trial balance. The Gulf division of all supports has been losing money on a monthly basis. The Gulf division incomes accounts are presented below. So this is the Gulf division that is presented. You got all components and Gulf division. So. Because Gulf Division has been losing income, the Gulf Division income statements also present. The Board of Directors decides on April 30th, year one, to dispose of the Gulf Division. So the minute the decision is taken, Gulf Division becomes an element of discontinued operations. It cannot be combined with other operations. Uh, okay. So the carrying value of the Gulf Division is $400,000. And its fair market value is 2.2 million. So what they're saying is <coughs> on this particular date, the book value of all the assets minus liabilities is 4 million, but the market value is only 2.2 million. Now, what kind of loss is this? This is impairment loss. Impairment loss of 1,800,000. How is it presented in year one? If you look at the solution in year one, it says loss, impairment loss, 1800, but impairment loss, so 2.4 million minus 2.2, but it is presented net of taxes. So impairment loss net of taxes is 1080000. 
So in year one, I will present impairment loss of one million and eighty thousand. Okay. Also, now let's let's go to the next. Uh, continue reading. After months of digestion, the the division is sold in year two. And this one. Now the other thing that they told us was that this company is losing money every month. Now, how much is money are they losing? Um, okay, this company is losing two hundred thousand dollars per month. So, how much is the loss on operations? Now, remember, though the decision was taken, was taken uh, the the decision was taken on April thirtieth, year one. You have to take the entire uh, loss from the beginning of the year. So for 12 months, the loss on operations was $2.4 million, $200,000 times 12. And that is presented net of taxes. And so it is presented 1,440,000. So in year one, I will present loss from operations 1.44 and impairment loss 1.08. There's no disposal. So I will not present any disposal. In year two, I have disposal. So I have uh, loss from operations again for six months, net of taxes that much, and loss from loss from uh, impairment, uh, loss on disposal year two that much here. So that is how you present all this one here. Now they here you know they're not they're not uh, in this particular example they are not showing you year two here, they are only showing you year one. So if you look at income statement, income from continuing operations. We use the definition continuing up 4.87, then loss from operations and loss from disposal. So your net income in year one is 2.355. Now my net income in year two is 5.22. In year two, I have a loss on discontinued operations for six months, net of taxes, 720. If you see 1.2 million minus 40%, 720. And then loss on disposal because I sold my assets. Uh, I, I had a loss of this much, uh, uh, 200,000 and net of taxes is 120. So year two, my net income will be 4.360. So is that clear to everybody? Is this discontinued operations clear to everybody? Yeah. Okay. So this is a part of so my income statement will look like this income from continuing operations plus or minus discontinued operations net of taxes and then i'll come up to net income so now we come to module six which is accounting changes accounting changes and correction of errors you know whenever you have some ch you make changes and there are some mistakes how is the accounting treatment for all that one so number one there are four kinds of changes that we have one is a change in estimate. Second is a change in accounting principle. Third is a change in entity. And fourth is a change in a correction of an error or which is also called a prior period adjustment. <coughs> so we're going to take all these changes and see how they're how what is the accounting treatment. First one is a change in estimate. You know, remember we did uh, we did uh, estimates for depreciation, like you know the estimated life of a machinery is ten years. So, whenever there's a change in estimate, you it is always a prospective approach. What is a, what is a prospective approach? You will not go and adjust the past period. You will only adjust the future period. Okay. An example of that would be, you know, I have, I, I estimated that uh, I had a machinery of 20, uh, 90,000. I estimated the life of the machinery will be 10 years. So year one depreciation is 9,000, year two depreciation is 9,000. At the beginning of the third year, <clears throat> I, I, uh, I said that the life will only be five years. So already I have depreciated how much? 18,000. How much is left now? 90,000 minus 18,000. So the net book value is 72,000. 
So now I will depreciate 72,000 over the remaining life, three years, 24,000 every year. Is that clear? I have not gone back and changed the depreciation of year one, year two. I've only taken the new depreciation amount of year three, year four, year five, because the life of the asset has been, has decreased. So a change in estimate has a prospective approach. I will not go and adjust the old periods. I will only adjust the future periods. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. So, so that is, that is uh, okay. Now there are certain uh, things that are classified as a change in estimate. One is whenever you change to the LIFO method of inventory valuation, or whenever you change the method of depreciation, those are also treated as a change in estimate. Now, what about a change in accounting principle? A change in accounting principle means retrospective application. You go and change all the periods of the past also. Okay, you go back. Okay, so how do you change that now? Uh, now, in this example, on January 1st, year one, Harbor decided to switch from the weighted average method of inventory valuation to the FIFO method. So here, whenever I change my method of inventory valuation, it's going to affect my profit, it's going to affect my cost of goods manufactured, cost of goods sold, everything like that. So what I will do is I will change the method right from inception. Suppose I've been doing this method for the last five years. I will take the cumulative effect of that change in method and I will present it as a net amount, net of taxes. So you, I will go back and restate. Now let me give you one example here. Suppose I was using the weighted average method for last five years. This year, I decided to change to the FIFO method. So this year, what I will do is I will calculate the total effect of that change for five years. And uh, it comes to $200,000. I will deduct the tax portion out of that 160. Now this 140 has to be allocated between those five years but I only have two years of account presented, right? I have the accounts presented for year, for two, for this current year and previous year. So I will restate what is presented, what, what uh, financial statements are presented and for the three years that are not presented, I will change the opening return earnings balance of the, uh, of year four. Is that clear? Okay, let me, let me explain you something very simply. Okay, so my five years of uh, change in accounting principal impact is $200,000. The tax part is 60,000. So the net effect is 140,000, but that net effect belongs to five years. So when I present my financial statements this year, I'm presenting 2020 and 2019. 16, 17, and 18 are not presented. The total change of 140 net of taxes belongs to 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Five years. So I will restate 19 and 20 because they are presented. <coughs> I will use the new method of inventory valuation in 19 and 20. I will restate them. But because 16, 17, and 18 are not presented, and say one uh, three fifths of 140,000 belongs to these three years. So let's take it as roughly about uh, what? About say, uh, say 80,000. 80,000 belongs to the three years <clears throat> net of taxes. So what I will do is I will book that 80,000 in the opening retained earnings balance of year four. That is how we do the uh, change in accounting principle. <clears throat> okay, so we, we know that uh, LIFO is, uh, if you change to a LIFO, it is like a change in estimate. You change the depreciation method, it's again again that. Now, what is, what is the change in entity? Again, 
the treatment is exactly like a change in accounting principle. A change in entity means what? When we say there's been a change in entity, what do we mean? I'll give you one example. In, in, in the current year, I invested, I bought two new, I made two new investments. I had two new subsidiaries. Previous year, I only had one subsidiary. This time I have three subsidiaries. So when I present my accounts, uh, comparative accounts of 19 and 20, they're not comparative because uh, in, in 19, I only had one investment, one subsidiary. In 20, I had three subsidiaries. So what, what, uh, so US GAAP requires that you restate 19. You make an assumption in 19, retroactive application. You make an assumption in 19 that I had three subsidiaries and you will restate it. Okay. Correction of an error is also called a prior peer adjustment. Again, retrospective, you go back and you may correct that error. Okay. And you correct it in the period in which the error took place. Suppose in 16, in, in the year 2016, I made a mistake. And I discovered that mistake in 2020. How will you correct it? Can anybody tell me how you'll correct that mistake? Because 2016 is not presented, I will take the effect of that correction, net of taxes, and I will adjust the opening retained earnings balance of 2019. If if uh, if in uh, if I if this mistake happened in 19 and I discovered it in 20, because 19 is presented, I will restate 19. Is that clear? Very similar to what you would do in uh, change in accounting principle. If the accounts are presented, I will restate it. If they're not presented, I will change the opening retained earnings balance. So here they mentioned how, how will you affect the retained earnings balance and all this stuff. Now look at the retained earnings balance. So basically, for accounts that are not presented, I will do the adjustment by adjusting the opening retained earnings balance. So this is my retained earnings balance for opening balance is 28 million for prior period adjustment. This is a correction of an error. I had to adjust the opening retained earnings balance. I took out the income tax. Then there was a change in accounting principle. I took the income tax out. I restated my net income. So I have changed my opening net income opening retained earnings balance and I've done all the adjustments net of taxes in that one there. Okay. Per us cap, which of the following statements is correct regarding accounting changes that result in financial statement that are in fact the statements of a different entity. What does that mean? There's been a change in entity. So what, how, how do we correct the change in entity? Can you, can somebody answer this question for me? Last year I had four subsidiaries. This year I had five. How will I change it? A retrospective where you see, uh, assume last year we had five subsidiaries. Okay. So what is the answer? Hello? Hello? So what is the answer for that?
So what is the answer A, B, C or D? So whenever there's a change in an accounting entity, you have to restate. You have to assume that last year you also had five subsidiaries. So the answer is D. All financial statements of prior period should be restated. Okay, next one. For year one PAC estimated two years of equipment warranty based on hundred of experience indicated that the earnings should have been based on 110, 110 per unit. The effect of this time difference from an estimate is reported as what? How do you report a change in estimate? Do you go back and change it or do you only change the current and the future periods? Just the current and the future period would do, right? I'm just thinking, thinking exactly. So what is the answer? Um, income from A B as an accounting change net of tax below your two income from continuing year. As an accounting change net of tax. Is it an accounting change? Uh, not really. So A, A, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it, was, no. it is not a change in accounting change. It is a change in estimate. So the answer is A. It's an income from continuing operation. You will book the excess depreciation or the accept warranty expense in year two. And it will be a part of income from continuing operations. Okay. So we go to the next one, which is comprehensive income. Now we remember, remember I told you that there are certain parts, certain transactions, which are with non owners. And uh, those are called other comprehensive income. But the key thing is that the other comprehensive income is not a part of income statement. It is a part of shareholders equity account. So what the, the definition of comprehensive income is, what is the total income? Income that is reported in the income statement and other comprehensive income that is reported in shareholders equity account. The total of all this is, so net income plus other comprehensive income is called comprehensive income. <coughs> and you know what net income is. Net income is the total of income from continued operations and discontinued operations. So what is other comprehensive income, which is reported goes to shareholders equity account. One is pension adjustments. You just have to remember the, the, you know, the, the various five kinds of adjustments. One is pension adjustments, unrealized gains on available for sale debt securities, foreign currency translation adjustments, credit risk, effective portion of a cash flow hedge and under IFRS revaluation surplus. All these are told, all these go under what category? These five or six things that are given to you go under what? Other comprehensive income. Other comprehensive income includes pension adjustments, unrealized gains on debt securities, foreign currency translation items, uh, credit risk, effective portion of a cash flow as for IFS revaluation surplus. And then they are all now. What do you mean? What do you mean by reclassification adjustment? Reclassification adjustment is that you you have to shift, you have to make uh, make changes uh, from one area to another. So I'll give you one example. Suppose. Uh, there was an available for sale debt security. Okay. So we know that debt securities have to be, uh, have to be uh, reported at fair market value. Right. Now I had a debt security of 1000 
in the beginning of the year at the end of the year it was 1100 so there was an unrealized gain of 100 where will that unrealized gain go other comprehensive income where will that go shareholders equity account next year i sell that security it is no longer unrealized it is now realized so i will take out that 1000 from other comprehensive income and i and i will put it into income from continuing operations so reclassification means adjusting from other comprehensive income to continuing operations and other comprehensive income is all cumulative they all become a part of shareholders equity account now you know because we have this concept of other comprehensive income uh, us cap requires you to show the total to the shareholders the total of in net income plus other comprehensive income so there are two ways of showing it one is single method you may you show all the uh, net income and uh, separately like here if you see that i've got net income then i've got other comprehensive income this is shown separately in uh, footnote disclosures so i've got 1340 as one step the the second method is that i show it as two step i show net income separately and other uh, other expenses separately like that so this is shown in footnote disclosures but in income statement alone you only go up to net income is this part clear yes okay so rest is you know i mean uh, base you have to other reporting issues basically what it means is that you always have to show net income uh, uh, anything uh, that goes into other comprehensive income is always shown as net of taxes so here you like this is uh, changes uh, you know beginning balance and reclassification you know because it became realized and then you to put a total you take all the reclassification okay one of the elements of financial statement is comprehensive income comprehensive income includes excludes excludes changes in equity resulting from which of the following the word is excludes so can you tell me uh, the answer to this <coughs> Dividends paid to shareholders. Exactly. Dividends are uh, out of retained earnings. They have nothing to do with uh, this one here. Comprehensive, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next chapter is adjusting entries. Now, you know, you have a you have a trial balance, right? A trial balance is based upon all your general entries, which are debit balances, credit balances of the transactions that have been that have taken place now after after you have a, a trial balance uh, you make some adjustments to the trial balance and why do we make adjustments because we might have made some mistakes we might have uh, we might have uh, uh, we might have made some mistakes or we might not have booked some expenses. We might not have booked some revenues or we might, you know, various, various situations. Okay. So, so what are the, uh, so the, the entries would be, uh, adjusting general entries would be firstly, let's, let's take unearned revenue. If I receive, uh, Ten thousand dollars for uh, say I received ten thousand dollars in November, and it covers insurance for for uh, two years. What entry did I What entry did I make in November? In November, I when I when I received insurance revenue. So, okay, let's say somebody paid me rent for two years in November. For two years, November first. So when I receive the rent, what entry will I make? 
prepaid rent to uh, sorry no, cash I, to prepaid i have received rent yeah sorry <clears throat> i have received cash i will debit cash and because it is known not revenue as yet i will i will credit unearned revenue right yeah that's so okay let's let's, let's take some numbers somebody pays me 2400 dollars on november 1st of 2019 and this is this is uh, rental revenue for 2 years so on december 31 so the entry i will make on november 1st is debit cash because i'm receiving cash of 2400 <coughs> i will credit unearned revenue of 2400 on december 31st i will make unearned revenue of 200 200 dollars because 100 dollars per month november and december and i will credit revenue of 2 200 so this is a correction of unearned revenue right got it na huh? okay same thing with expenses suppose i had paid rent of 2400 to somebody else so in that case because i had paid rent i would debit i would debit what prepaid expenses prepaid rent 2400 and i will credit cash of 2400 and then in december 31st i will debit rent expense of 200 and credit prepaid rent of 200 so these are prepaid expenses the same entry that i made so one was prepaid uh, revenues and prepaid expenses now what is the so prepaid expenses and prepaid revenues means you have already either received it or you have already paid it now the second one is accrued revenues and accrued expenses you have neither received it nor you have paid it but you are entitled to it suppose i have already uh, uh shipped my goods but i have not made any uh, recording of the revenue so i will record the revenue as accounts receivable to revenue secondly i have not estimate i have not uh, booked an expense for say salaries for the month of december so i will book that i will debit expenses and i'll credit accrued uh, accrued liabilities right correction of an error basically you correct an error you know you booked uh, you booked something uh, wrong now in this example let's say on december 31st year 1 i received 250 dollars in cash uh, during year 1 and year 2 so number 1 it is a, uh, i booked everything as revenue so what i will do is general entry to record deferred revenue cash to deferred adjusting entry will be unearned revenue to service revenue so for the period that has lapsed i will recognize half of that as revenue because this was for two months this so that is a correction of an error and interest suppose if somebody gives me a loan of 2 million and i have not recorded the interest for two months i will record that interest on december 31st interest expense to interest payable so this particular example is an example of uh, all the adjustments that you can have um, you know we can quickly go over it like you know number 1 the company purchased 303 years revenue insurance policy and it was all expensed so instead of expensing it it was all, instead of you know uh, putting it into future it was all expensed so it was prepaid expense and you will you will correct that so you can go through these examples they give you a full very good example of all these general entries that you need to collect okay on october 31st year 1 a company has a calendar year end of 90th sorry on october 31st year 1 a company with a calendar year end paid 90000 services that will be performed evenly over 6 months from november 1st year 1 through april 31st year what is the entry what is the adjusting entry that you should properly record in year 1 statements and the mistake that the company made was the company expensed 90000 in october 1st so what they're saying is how what what entry will you make on december 31st year 1 can can somebody tell me that
What, what is the answer? Anybody? It's not a difficult question. I mean, just think, think through it and then uh, tell me what the answer is. Hello? Okay, I'm going to help you with this. On October 31st, year one, a company with a calendar year paid $90,000 for services that were, that will be evenly performed for six months from November 1st, year one through April. So what is the entry that they made on October 31st? The answer is the company expensed $90,000 cash payment. So what they did in what they did in October 31st was they debited services expense by 90,000 and credited cash by 90,000. So that was the entry that was made. But the 90,000 expense only is for six months. <coughs> so how much is the actual expense uh, for November and December? Only 30,000, 15,000 per month. So what you should do is you should reduce your services expense by 60,000. Because you debited the service expense to 90,000, and you have to, and you should have only debited to the extent of 30,000. So you will credit services expense by 60,000. So the answer is B, debit prepaid services and credit services expense for 60,000. Is that clear? Is everybody clear on that? Hello? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right, I think that uh, that brings us to the end of this uh, chapter financial uh, one. Now, you know, wh what is the methodology for studying this? Is uh, Number one, you know, we are the pioneers of bringing CPA to India. Uh, I did my CPA in 97. I got selected by Becker to open up CPA centers in India. We are the largest CPA review center in India. We have centers in 12 cities. We do training for 1000 companies. Every competitor in India who's running CPA is a student of mine. You know, everybody has taken the CPA course with us. We have 120 CPA teachers. We will help you with everything, registration, training, uh, scheduling your examination. And we will also give you free training in US taxation. I have two CPA firms. So we'll give you training in US taxation also. All that is a part, and then we'll help you with jobs also. So, uh, but the important thing is that uh, you have a moral, resp moral responsibility to yourself to uh, go over the material before you come for the class after the class, go back, go over the material again, and then attempt every multiple choice questions and make sure you understand them and get them right before you come for the next class. So this is your routine regularly for the next six to eight months. If you do that diligently and then you leave 
uh, two months for the final preparation before you go and write the exam, you will pass the examination. So now if you have any questions, I can help you answer them. Any questions you have? Anybody, any questions with eligibility, with licensing, with scheduling the examination, whatever, whatever questions you have, I can help you answer. And uh, we, is there a class tomorrow? We have you been intimated about a class tomorrow or not? No, we didn't get any invite. Okay, so probably the class is going to be next week, uh, next week, uh, which will be financial two. So you'll get a you'll get an intimation to a, to join a Zoom class, and then uh, that will be class two. Uh, we have 120 teachers. I could be teaching you, or somebody else could be teaching you, but uh, you are free to uh, ask questions to any one of us. So uh, any any more questions you have? Sir, just one question. Um, due to the COVID. Uh, actually, myself and my colleague is not able to get the books. Is there any possibility to get any PDF document? Maybe chapter wise, whatever the chapter is going to be covered. Only that chapter you can send it. I do understand that uh, notes are not provided in PDF. No, but uh, have you paid the full fees? Yeah. You have not got the online access? No, online access is there, but let's say when you are teaching, if you want to market out something, it's, it's preferable that we market on the physical document rather than on the uh, online one. Oh. And we are trying to get that books. Uh, in fact, Shamili is also trying to see how we can get the courier done or something, but nothing is working out as of, as of now. Where are you located? Mauritius. Yeah, yeah. Once you know what we will do is, we will give you, uh, we will give you. We're not supposed to give this uh, instructor version to our students, but what we will do is, we will uh, share the screen with you. Um, when you get the books, we'll share the screen with you, and you can underline. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because you know, technically, uh, and we are not allowed to forward uh, our instructor manuals to anybody. So we will we'll share the screen with you, and you can quickly underline, and then we can we can do that. That's not a problem. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, yeah, just just uh, be regular about your studies, regular about your homework, and we'll see you next week. Okay. Thank you. Any, anybody, any questions? Okay, then, see you. Thank what you. time is it in India now? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock, yeah. Nine o'clock. So, okay, so you can, uh, you know, do your homework uh, and then we'll take it from there. All right, and uh, I will help you with everything. I, I teach uh, all the subjects on and off. I'll be coming and teaching you. Uh, if I was in India, I would be teaching more here, you know, because last time I could not teach you properly because uh, I was teaching you at one o'clock at night. That was one reason. And then, you know, we were having some Zoom difficulties. So we decided to repeat this today's lecture again. Uh, but uh, we will work out the timings. When I'm teaching you, the classes will be around six o'clock in the evening. Uh, otherwise, there'll be morning class. If there's any instructor, we have 120 teachers. So if there's any instructors in India, they will be teaching in the morning also. So you'll get a, you'll get a mail on the next class and uh, what time and who will be teaching and all this stuff. Okay, all right. So can we, can we get the recording of this session? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Just write a mail, you will get a full recording of this section. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye.